Well, hello, everybody, and hello, Chad. How was your week this week, Chad? We got the kids back in school. My week has been much better than <laughs> it has say, been for a while. I, I was coming in today, and I was thinking, man, I'm just kind of tired for some reason, and I don't understand what's different. And I thought, well, it's been awful dang cold lately. And another one I thought was, well, yeah. I mean, we've had uh, quite a few days where it was bitterly cold, which then incorporated kids not going to school. Yep. And I know it wore my wife out pretty good because, you know, it's it's so bitterly cold. You're not going to send them outside. Yeah. Right? Oh, no. So, you know, the whole family, and I mean, well, everybody other than me because I'm not caged up inside all the time. Yeah. Uh, cabin fever, baby. Yeah. I mean, it's been it's been pretty nuts. Yeah. So, yes, it's been a much better week this week. And, uh, yeah, so... We're just waiting for the weather to pass. That's kind of how I feel. Is like, I'm waiting. I keep every day. I'm like, oh, thank goodness. We're just another day closer. I mean, we're at this stage where I love to enjoy fall and a little bit of winter. And then now we set into the just bitterly bone chilling cold. It's usually windy. Uh, throw some snow on top of that, which just makes travel treacherous. In fact, uh, in personal experience, another thing I have to deal with with the uh, uh, recent weather is uh, i got one of my my children got their their vehicle stuck ah uh, yes yeah. yeah it's it's bound to happen to everybody Sorry. sooner or later yeah. and you know just so what i got to say on this uh, quite honestly is folks welcome to where chad and mary grew up i mean this is just a sample okay because where where i grew up where my wife grew up which was even a little further north than me um it was like this all the time and you wouldn't get you wouldn't get the snowstorm melted away before the next one came. And then you would have yet another week or two of these ungodly, ridiculous low temperatures. And so everything would just stack up, you know, and, and, you know, you, when a family like mine turns around and goes and visits a place like upstate Minnesota in January and they, you know, you, you're just driving and you're seeing all that snow and you're like, man, for one, I'm sitting there going, it's going to suck, but my kids are going, oh, I can't wait to go play in it. Yeah. Well, it's frozen rock hard. Yes. Yes. It ain't, it ain't <laughs> and, like and soft snow. That is where we are right now. Yeah. And um, unfortunately, this weekend, it looks like our temperatures are going to dip down again and we're going to be doing some refreezing and yada, yada, yada. The good news is that there's not more snow in the forecast, just yeah. cold temperatures. Just and cold uh, temperatures. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward to that. I mean, like I was saying, I love bitterly cold, nasty, bone chilling temperatures. How about you, Chad? No. <laughs> it makes no, everything and, harder. And, you know, I and straight up, I, I, we, we're... we're we had we had chatted a little bit that we wanted to at least give mention that the kids are back in school, right? I know because I see socials that the school district took a little heat for the most recent closure. Um, and by you know mid afternoon when it actually warmed up, hear my words, warmed up to twenty degrees. Yeah, people were coming unglued and yada yada yada. They should have been in school. They should have been in school. They should have been in school. Guess what happened on that very day? On that very day, Newton Public Library hosted a author talk. And said author, and I name escapes me, sorry, should have wrote it in my notes, um, was speaking about her book that was dedicated to the children's blizzard of 1888. 1888. I've seen that. Yeah. yeah. And within her book, there's a chapter that's based on Newton, Kansas. And it's based on what it must have been like uh, to be a student at the Kellis School. Um, and I, and, and I got to tell you, the reason it's be called the Children's Blizzard because of all the kids who froze to death. And in that case, it was on their way home from school. But, you know, we, we really don't want to have the reverse case about because, you know, after that blizzard, they were, you know, in some of our some of our urban areas, they were finding kids in trash cans. They, they had no idea where to go or what to do to get out of the cold. And they were diving into trash cans and they were found there dead. I mean, that's just this is some scary stuff. Yeah. And 
And so, you know, you can call me whatever names you want. You can call me a wuss if you want. But I'm just going to look right at you and say, I grew up in this crap, and I've known about the children's blizzard my entire life. And on the morning of Monday morning, we had temperatures that were dangerously cold. Yeah. And the last thing you want is kids walking to school and that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you won't hear me complain. When right. a school closes uh, because they think that it's inclement weather or, or whatever the need is. I mean, I, I know that's viewed differently by each individual parent based upon their career, job, sure. kids, you where, bet. how old those kids are. Can they be left alone or whatever the case may be? But I've never cursed the school, I don't think, ever for closing in the event that we're having inclement weather. Well, and you know, from a weather perspective alone, could they have gotten away with starting school a couple hours late? Yes. Mm -hmm. But you've got all those logistics to deal with. How many of those parents who drive their kids to school are not going to be available at 9 a.m.? Yeah. So the kids are going to be walking yeah. and they're going to be leaving well before nine. So, you know, there's in this particular case, they're going to be leaving when it's still dangerously cold yeah so could they have sure and but why you know, is it i got a question chad i understand that school is a priority yeah. i understand school is a priority and academics are a priority but i will say in our evolving uh, life that i don't the evolve evolving of our educational system as it may be um does it is it really gonna make or break a student i mean why do people make an issue out of it when in in the grand to, grand scheme of things i guess the question is is why is it that it becomes a a a drum for somebody to beat or or have a problem with it or think that their opinion matters when it comes to whether or not the school district should have closed or shouldn't close or whatever because there's people are so I just want to say they're so self-centered, <laughs> well, but they're just like, they're only looking is. at it from their left. Well, well, I used to walk, you know, and I've heard this thing. I've used to walk, you know, up and to and there and fro and thumb and then, you know, and everything else. And it's like, well, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot to that, right? Like, did you walk five miles, a half a mile, a quarter mile? I mean, did, was you in elementary school? Did you really walk that far? Did it seem like it's, I mean, there's, there's so many variables, right? Because I used to walk to school in this weather too when I was in elementary school. And you know what? I was three blocks away from the elementary school. <laughs> so in the state of Kansas, <laughs> so, and I don't know how far. Like, come on now. I My don't mom know. was like, I can see her there. <laughs> I don't know how far back these rules go. I'm just going to state that unequivocally. I don't know how far back the rules go or when they were made. But I can tell you that at this time in the state of Kansas, that walk is less than two miles, period. No ifs, no ands, no buts about it. It is two miles or less. So, do you want a kid walking two miles to school in 20 below weather and wind chill? I would say no. Well, there, and I, and I, and I, I did see, and, some, okay, yeah, and I, and, I there's been social media comments, right? Yeah. And I'm not a, I'm not a social media, whatever, but I saw some people posting that they thought that there should have been school and making comments about it while you go to their Facebook and a couple pictures down, it's if you're leaving your dog outside, you're an evil human being. So I just, <laughs> you know, and I'm not going there. I just rationale. And, and there's a reason it's two miles. And that is that the state will not reimburse transportation for anything under two miles away from the school. Hmm. And because the state won't reimburse it, now we're talking how much money can your district afford to lose trying to bus kids from within that two miles. Now there's some exemptions. Special ed would be one of them. Okay. Hmm. But for them, but that's the rule. So I'll ask an ignorant question that I'm guessing you probably know. But when, when we're talking about the high school, no busing for the high school or outside of two miles, there's busing or the, 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 the two mile halo, as it were, is for each. It's each building. Okay. 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 That's what it is. Okay. Um, 
there's very little bus traffic truly when you consider the size of the school and the district that we're in there's really not a whole lot of bus traffic to the high school and that's because in this community we prioritize kids driving themselves so then that goes back to maybe one of the reasons and i know i've commented in the past and about um situations that unfold because of santa fe just releasing this fifth and sixth sixth grade level of kids out onto the street. If we had some kind of a busing system, theoretically, you'd be dropping them off. And there are but there are buses that do go to Santa Fe. Yeah. For kids that are outside the two miles. Bingo. But every kid within that two mile has to make their way to They gotta figure it out, man. <sighs> and and you know what? I've I've had three kids. Two of them are done at yeah. Santa Fe. And, you know, there's a whole other issue that goes with two of them are done at Santa Fe. Um, one of them is still there. And so, you know, and this afternoon, our family's got to figure it out. Yeah. He's well within that two miles. Okay. And if he's going to, if he decides to take a saxophone home today, that instrument is freaking bigger than he is. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I'm not going to expect him to carry it to our house. So we got to figure it out. That's just, the, that's the way it works. But does that go back to parental caring? I mean, we could stay and rest here for a long time, but. Well, we could. But I know that, um, I don't know. We probably Parents have to make wrong. their own decisions about yeah. that stuff. Yeah. You can't expect the school to raise your kids and you can't expect for the parents to do nothing and expect the, I mean, it just, it's just. Again, they, parents have to make those decisions on their own. Yeah. It's just that's just the way it is, and 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 it's as a parent, right here, it is my responsibility to make that decision. Same. Okay. Yeah. And so when you're when you're talking about whether or not the kids should be walking to school on a morning when it's twenty below, yeah, parents parents have that decision, and they they should if there is school. Parents should have the right to say, uh, no. Yeah. Well, you okay. do last I checked. But here's the thing. The way things are structured, that would be an unexcused absence. And the reason that's important is um, it hasn't, to my knowledge, really played out bigly yet, but it's going to that this school district and our county attorney have seriously recommitted to truancy. You get too many unexcused absences, you're truant. Hmm. That, that family vacation is not an excused absence. I'm sorry, folks, and I've done it. I've pulled my kids and we've gone to Minnesota because it's an emergency situation with grandma, grandpa, we've got to go. There's just no two ways about it. So I pulled kids out. But every one of those days is an unexcused absence. That is not an excused absence. Yeah. Okay. I don't, there's a lot of people bucking institutions. So, Chad. so I mean, when we, you think we're about sitting here parent... with a with a recommitment to tr- to truancy. Yeah. Okay. And at the end of the day, if you don't take that seriously, it is well within the county attorney's right. And it is well within the school district's right to turn around and refer your kid to me over at juvenile intake. I haven't done one yet. Don't want to do one. But it can happen. So when you start talking about weather, that's unexcused. Hmm. So, you know, you can have that debate. And if you want to have that debate, the time to have that debate is... And whenever, I think it's this next Monday night, I don't know, i got to look at my calendars, but it's 7 o'clock, and it's McKinley, and there's the Board of Education. But this only applies, see? I mean, I, I don't know, I'm going political here, okay? I'm going policy and political here. But there's an element of, you know, there are people that believe that if you want to take your kid out of school at any given time, any given moment, that you should be well within your right to do that, Okay. But I'll also say that this only applies if you enroll your child into public school. 
Correct. Because if you're a homeschooler or you go by a different criteria, which the state of Kansas anyway allows for it to be pretty fluid from what I understand. I mean, um, I don't know if things have changed, but if, if you homeschool, I think there's a very, very, very low, low, low bar that has to be met for you to be considered like a graduated high school student, I guess. I don't know. Now, that doesn't mean that's the case, right? Because there are lots and lots and lots of people, and I'll say this, lots of people that wind up excelling when it comes to homeschooling. And they wind, wind up being exceptionally exceptionally advanced when it comes to their academics. As a college teacher, I saw it, right? Sure. So um, I'm not. I'm just trying to clean up to make sure nobody thinks I think that people that homeschool are getting a less than standard education, but I'm just using that as a model to reference when saying that, well, if your child homeschools and you don't have them signed into school, then there's no truancy. No. So then is that, could but that be one of the reasons And I know I read this in the Kansas? Can, let's, let's be straight, dude. If you're homeschooling your kid, how often are you canceling school for weather? Well, I catch what you're saying, but you, <laughs> I mean, but you catch on. what I'm saying. I'm talking about just attendance. Yeah. When, when you have your child enrolled in public school, there's a governmental entity that is overseeing that to make sure that your contractual agreement with them, them with you is upheld, which means that you have rights and then they have responsibilities and their responsibilities are, well, you need to maintain X amount of days. So and if you don't, then they turn you over to an agency that then would be... Well, like we talked about, I mean, I'm just, I'm just thinking, right. But yet, if you just take your kids out of public school, you don't have any of that headache. And I read something in the Kansan and I was going to talk about it, but it wasn't an author of the Kansan staff. It wasn't you. I'm sure you know what's in and what's not, but I didn't want to grill you too hard on it. And it just had to do with how Missouri and Kansas schools have children leaving in droves. And they can't figure out where they're going. They're homeschooling. They're going Not to all privatized education. Not all of them. There, there are literally missing kids. That people just say, well, but in someone, in someone there regard. There are kids that have just absolutely, when it comes to education, they've just disappeared. So what is that different than homeschooling? I mean, if I'm a person, let's just say, and I've got my kid and I'm like, you know what? I'm fed up with so this So what school. I'm saying is that there are kids that are no longer in the public school system. They're not being homeschooled. There's no record that that's going on. They're not in a pub, private school. There's no record that they're in private school either. But is there a really there, a need? Because I'm telling you, when it comes to homeschooling, I do believe, now, please correct me if I'm wrong, anybody want to engage with this or whatever, but speaking from personal experience of past history, so this has been the case years ago because I homeschooled at one point in time for two different years, okay? And um, at that time, we signed up for an actual curriculum because that legitimized what well, I was doing. But even even your homeschools have to be there. There has to be some supervisory. There is some supervision there. Okay. What? Well, so there there's is a list of accreditations. There's 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 required supervision from uh, I believe it's certified teachers. Okay. Okay. So there has to be some contact. It's not complete autonomy. Okay. So there has to be some. Okay. Um, and that's why when I'm sitting here and I'm saying that there's kids missing, there's just no record of them being anywhere. Okay. And so the numbers aren't adding up. Okay. So I got a question and, and I get that people, I know what people are doing. What they're doing is, is they're just wind up uh, saying, hey, I'm, I'm fed up with this and what they're doing, and I'm just going to take my kid out of school. And they're not, they're not going to be in school anymore. I'm done with it. Sure. Why not? I mean, do they reserve that right? I would say so. I mean, I don't know, Chad. I, this, I this mean, is the question that we're there. literally coming to now with this. It's there. I mean, we've got culmination, you know, open and, enrollment. And for, got, and for those people who can handle that financially, good. Go for it. 
I don't, you know, it's well, whatever. Let's but. talk about parental responsibility. I hate to say it, but we live in a culture in which it would nice to be nice to believe that everybody was being honest. But let's say they're just not. Or that there are people that might not have your best intention and at their mind. Maybe their own best intention might be leading the way of their mindset while they deceive you into believing they care about you. Okay. So, or like, you know, I mean, there's, there's, I, I just, I, I, I live in this world eyes wide open because I believe that not everything is as someone wants to produce tray it to be and that there's a lot left with perception right so if we're talking about this let's say uh my little one right is uh going on two years not quite but we're somewhere in there right and <laughs> we're getting close if i just elected to never and i mean i'm just asking this question just never enroll them in school just keep them at home and never never enroll them in anything just homeschool them because I think that that uh, what I got is all he needs. And you can do that. And there's no problem with this. No. So then the, the, the level of education that this person may get. And there's nothing, there's nothing, no the, rules it, against that. Well, there's no rules against it, but there are, there are some rules about some, there, the rules surround being supervised by educators okay there has to somewhere along the line there has to be a certified educator that is at least consulted okay i mean that's just that's it okay and and so if you want to homeschool your kid go for it i mean seriously yeah. um i'm not anti-homeschooling you, people we will we, you know you will not be subject to some of the same rules and specifically, let's talk attendance. Does that mean educational threshold? So it's attendance and educational. You threshold. bet. You bet. So you know, I there's a, there's a family in my church, multiple children, and they're homeschooling them all. And those kids never get a day off. They're at it every day. So the last. The last almost month where my kids didn't have school, those kids had school. Yeah. yeah. Every day. They didn't get school canceled because they weren't. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The flip side is that usually they get more summertime. Okay. Usually. That makes sense. Right. And, and, and what's nice is. Mom is and that dad can say, we're going to take a week off here and we're going to take yeah. a week off there because they're in charge. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But. They're, they're the ones making the decisions. Now, those of us that have our kids in public schools, we're not making those decisions. We elect to allow for them by and okay. them up then. I don't get to pick when spring break is. Believe me, I would love to be able to do so. I don't get to pick when fall break is. Believe me, I would love to do so. I would make it line up with some of the things that I would love to do in my personal life that does not include my kids being in school or even in this state when school is in session. I don't have that. I don't have that ability. And, and, and one of the reasons is that your public school system has some rules that it has to go by. Not necessarily set by themselves. Yeah. Responsibilities right? that they're able to they, have to They meet. have responsibilities for, I mean, seriously, it's right down to how many minutes a day. Yeah. And this is that a, that, a, that a kid has to be offered yes. educational services. Yes. And for people that don't know this or understand this, that is done by the people you elect and or choose not to show up to elect. Correct. So, so there's, a, yeah. there's just different rules. <laughs> there's different rules. Chad, people always ask me this and I got to interject this. Why are you always attached with politics, Lance? Right. I mean, and I get this question. Why is it? I mean, some people are like, oh, it's always politics or whatever the case may be. And, you know, I went to school for all of this and all of this. I'm like, what's what's the and, and it comes down to the fact that like every single aspect of your life is not necessarily controlled, but controlled and or regulated by the federal government or by a governing entity of some kind. Whether or not you can just take your trash and go burn it out in your backyard, whether you can or can uh, can or can't have your child in school 
for so many days or, or make parental decisions that, that um, uh, are different than, than what maybe you think are supposed to be the right decisions made by a school board or, you know, and it, all of this really comes back to governance. And I want to say um, we didn't talk about it last time on the program. I wanted to talk about it, but there had been a change at the school board. So, um, you know, with the new elections that went through, I know you're a man that knows a lot more than I do when it comes to these things because you're there in person all the time. And I catch here and there and try my best. But um, so there's new leadership there. Yes. Right. And that is uh, who's who's run, who's who's was elected okay. among the board so, members to become the president of the board and who's the vice president now. sure so in the case of the president of the board the board chose both tradition and a different path that sounds weird doesn't it okay does that sound weird yeah it does it okay. does but i'll take it all right so <laughs> if it and, means good things it means and good things. and when i say tradition um it's very common practice amongst all of our local governing bodies that the vice chair or the vice mayor or the vice president moves into the presidency during board reorganization. And that is what they chose to do. The process in which they chose to do it was a little different than it's been in the past, but that is what they chose to do. So the board president for USD 373 is now Melissa Schreiber. Okay. She was the vice president for, I believe, two previous years. Okay. And um, one of the traditions that got broken was for a president and vice president to serve two years. Okay. Rather than one year. Okay. So in the beginning, this tradition was broken. This tradition was broken last election cycle. In in some ways. Theoretically, because in some it ways. should have moved to... So, so the, okay. and, the, and the reasoning behind it was, and, and, and I 100% agree with it, okay? The reasoning behind it was we... We went through a pandemic for crying out loud. Oh, okay. 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 Right? The pause. Okay. The pause. And so it's like, <sighs> and so they chose at the end of that year to just continue with the M and M. Most yes. This, right. This is this Mallory was and normal. Melissa. This was M and for everybody. Right. Yes. Yeah. A lot of play, a lot of people were doing a lot of yes. organizations were doing things Almost like this. Almost all of them. And again, I completely and totally agree with that. And so that's that's how Mallory ended in there for more than one year, and Melissa ended as the vice for more than one year. And but but now we're trying to put all of that behind us. We're trying to right move forward. Every, Every every quadrant of our society is trying to put that thing behind us. Yeah, yeah. Move on with business right? as normal. So Melissa became chair. And when I say that it was a little bit different in how that occurred, I cannot remember the last time there were multiple nominations for the presidency of the Board of Education. Well, and I got I was watching. Uh, okay, so and I'm it was done to, on yes. sealed ballot. Okay, which is also fine, okay. and that's I think standard procedure. But that was the departure from the norm, right? Because the norm is, quite honestly, what Andy Ortiz did that night. Yeah. Like, she's been vice, vice chair, vice president. I'm going to nominate her for president. That's the norm. Yeah. But why are we having all these people want to deviate from the norm? The exact same thing it's just occurred. like a drunk on power kind well, of thing. Well, yeah. The exact same thing just occurred at the Harvey County Commission. Yeah. Okay. We now have Becky Reimer as the chairman of the board of Harvey County Commissioners. She was the vice chair last year. Okay. And the exact same thing just happened at the city of Newton. Rod Crike became mayor after serving a term as Vice mayor. Well, and I want to take a sidestep, right? Because there was a conversation that Sissy and I had, and she had brought up something that she wanted to really dive into, and she even pleaded with the community or anybody that listened 
that we had tried to do everything we could so that way our county commission was more than three people. So maybe it would be right. five. And I understand what you're saying. It does make sense. There has been some discussions of that. Um, it makes sense all to do this with five, Chad, due, if you have a yes, two-year yeah, cycle, no, but four years I, I, and three all collected due respects officials to, doesn't. All due respects to Sissy, because she's not a part of this group that I'm about to mention, okay? But there has been discussions about expanding the county commission to five people, and it's been basically on the fringe. It's never been in center stage. It's always been just basically just these snide comments that are made during particularly hot meetings of the county commission and things are going on that people don't agree with and they just can't believe that we're letting this decision be made by only three people. I get it. But we shouldn't be. My opinion. Now, well, there is kind of a standard that there are three party commissions. Very, I mean, And I would, right. I would argue the... I would argue the following point. We're kind of getting off yeah, base here, sorry. but but I'm going to I'm going to argue a fo- something else about our county commission that right now our county commission is out of balance. The split between rural and city is out of balance. The, I I just that's just that is my belief. Well, and here's where it stems from. We have three members. Two of them represent rural interests. And they live rurally. And one of them. And one of them is urban. Yep. Only urban. Right. Now, here's the deal. Urban makes up well more than 50% of the population of this county. Our total population is about 33 to 34,000. 19,000 of those, so we're already at 50% here, right? 19,000 of those, give or take, live in Newton. Let's add North Newton, Heston, Halstead, half of Sedgwick. Those are all people living in a city environment, non rural okay? By the time you add all of them up, we are way over 50%. But right now, the, those 50% of the people are represented by 33% of our commission. We're out of balance. How are we going to rectify that if we go to five commissioners? How are we going to consider that if we go to five commissioners? How are we going to draw our districts if we go to five commissioners? Well, no matter what, you're going to talk about somebody not being happy about something. You got that right. So, you know, the, just just flipping the switch to go to five commissioners, that's a difficult, difficult conversation. There is a lot of stuff to think about when you start doing that, When you're, if you're going to expand the commission. Well, I would just say this. And, and, and what's going on The currently. reason I bring all of that up, is that every time I have heard, I can't believe they're only letting three people make this decision. I have also heard two of them live in the city. That's not right. Actually, it is right. Yeah, well... it's It, it was actually a representation of our population. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it yeah. was right. And technically, I'm pretty sure two out of the three commissioners live... Within uh, the city of Newton, don't they? At one time, not anymore. Okay. 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 So, there's a lot to think about. Hmm. But, you know, back to, you know, the whole leadership thing, right? So, Board of Education is Melissa Schreiber. Andy Ortiz became the vice chair. And it was the same process. There was a nomination and a, and a second. And then there was another nomination and a second. And then there was a sealed ballot. And on the sealed ballot, it was four votes for Andy, just as there were for Melissa, four. And between you, me, and the folks watching at home, probably the same four people. 
wrote, wrote down Andy's name. And three wrote down the name of Ian Long. And then the board turned around and voted 7-0 to make him the vice chair. So should the board observe tradition again next year, Andy will be the board president. Should they choose to not observe that, somebody else will be. In the case of the Harvey County Commission, again, tradition was observed. We have three commissioners. So Becky became president. Don Schrader, who was not in one of those two seats last year, became the vice and Randy becomes, if you want to call it that, the odd man out. But he's also up for election. Sure. But so that it kind has, of makes sense. Well, I mean, it, when you think uh, about but, it. But in all honesty, it has no bearing. Well, it doesn't. But it, it, in my opinion, it may not fall in any which way, form, or fashion. But that is the person that has the opportunity to be relieved of their duty. It would not be appropriate if they were the chair at that time. Because then you have somebody that just got elected. And then we're doing something and we're moving around and... See, that's the whole thing. Well, we talk about tradition, they, they, and then we talk about, like, like what happens when somebody gets um, scandalously political, which is kind of what I'm starting to see unfold in some different areas, sure. right? So we got some, some scandalous stuff going on, right? And nobody has a problem deviating from tradition, it seems like, on the school board, if in one case or the other. So, so even though that's tradition by the way that you said people were nominated and who was nominated, that would not follow with tradition. Well, okay. So it seems so like there until is, there's an opportunity for people to politicize it, Chad, well, then, and, and, then it's, and it's, it's be, this way I if it's good for me, this. but it's, if it's not this way for me, it's not good for you. I am, this is, this goes back to who we're electing. I believe that right now, um, I, I I I just say the moderate person is the moderate the moderate individual's life is being hijacked by two diametrically opposed political parties. It's bleeding down into our local level. I just you know why is it politics all the time? Because I'm watching this fiasco unfold, and people out here chanting, 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 mm -hmm. chanting, chanting, showing up, spending their time, spending their energy on nothing. Well, and and there is you know so believe me when I say the process they went through to select this board president and I'm talking board of education and vice president was different than it has been in the past okay in that there were multiple nominations specifically for president um, I think that we have seen that happen with the vice president before, but my brain is not able to pull it at this time. Pull up the you know. Oh, and I'm I sure I can't sit here and say and that I can't sit here and say in 2002 that happened. Well, that's I, the, I just can't do that. But I can tell you that I think it has happened for the vice presidency before. Okay. Okay. But it in my time here, this is pretty unheard of for the presidency. Mm. It is relevant and important to note that that both of those races those nominations went to sealed ballots and it was 4-3 there is a significant divide on our board of education this is no secret. Well, if you keep that going, that just means that you get to be elected again because you have somebody to go out and well, get the people to hate. Well, against, yes, so yes, then yes. That makes but you okay. At and, the you at know, the end of the day, it's politics as usual. At the end of the day, um, there's some things that there's some cold hard truths that people need to come to grips with. Okay, board of education, city commission. When you walk into that voting booth. There's no party affiliation on the ballot. Tell that to all the people that are going in there and voting, Chad. Because I'm telling you, that's the only thing people Just care about. look at the ballot. Are you a Democrat or are you a Republican? Are you pro-life or pro-choice? I'm a rhino. 
and I'm proud oh, of it. Oh, well, then you're a rhino. Uh, I'm not going to vote for you. I so, know I'm going to vote for but somebody I'm telling more you, aligned with my and political a, ideology. I mean, come on. And there's a reason that those are nonpartisan elections. Okay? Uh, out of all the elections that are out there, those two positions absolutely need to be nonpartisan. We should not be voting party line in city and school board. We just should not be. We need to be voting for the best person to make the decision. Period. No if, no ands, no buts, no coconuts. That is the deal. Because the closer that that decision maker is to your front door, the bigger effect they have on your life. Yeah. No, I don't disagree with you. The problem is, once again, and I'll go back to it before we beat it down, because we're going to talk about something I know that took place at the county commission level that, well, once again, represents just how partisan our elected officials can be. I mean... We're talking local level. We're talking municipal level, right? So there's not supposed to be party affiliation involved. But, but, but honestly, these are the driving, motivating factors behind people that go out and vote in primaries. These people that go out and vote during nonpartisan races. These people that go show up to meetings and, and demand that their political ideology get moved forward and promoted by the elected official who is the representative of the government and that that then gets inflicted upon everybody else and I'm sick and tired of seeing it, Chad. I'm gonna go down a road here, but I'm just so tired of it. I mean, on the cusp of us getting ready to have a presidential primary in the state of Kansas that we're gonna cover before we're at, and not to go on, these are not Chad's words, but I am, I am to my breaking point of, it's just like this drum that keeps getting beat in my head, example after example after example. Politics today, voting today, has literally deduced itself down to people who are involved, are involved because they want to elect somebody that is going to wield the sword of what they want done politically and policy speaking against everybody else. And if you don't like it, then that sword should cut your head off and you should be out the door and there is no agreeing with you. There is no anything with you. You are ostracized. And then, well, what do you do? Now you can't play in either playground, Chad. Right? It is insane. It's insane. Well, the unfortunate, the what unfortunate to part, conservatism Lance. meaning that you were limited government. Not, I'm a conservative, so I think the government should be able to, to, to wield its strong arm against you who is opposite of me whatever we put label on that it's there's a lot oh lance i'm, okay, gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, sorry no, i gotta it's stop fine. i gotta quit i gotta quit yeah because quite honestly i'm, I'm handing it over to chad of, you know the labels the labels now Sick. no longer mean anything but they do when it comes to a political they, prowess they don't they mean nothing because we've forgotten what they mean well, we've switched around and everything else, and, and, and we the have definition forgotten, has changed. Absolutely forgotten what they mean. You just gave a definition of a conservative, and it is an accurate definition of what a conservative is supposed to be. Okay, when you go to the roots of when we started using those words, a conservative was their main concern was fighting change. They did not want change. A liberal? Mm hmm I know people who've forgotten the, the meaning of that word. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why we've now designed classic liberal right? versus liberal so, now. So when you go to the roots of, of when that label began, liberal stood for liberty. Think about that. They stood for liberty. So how do you have liberty Let me ask and you this. less government equaling more government on both ends trying to dictate to us what the other wants done? Because we've forgotten the meaning of the words. On a moral level. On a moral level We've now. forgotten the meaning of the words. We have allowed them to get redefined and we have forgotten the meaning of the words. And then through empathy and lack of participation and obstinate ignorance, people do not go out and think that when they vote for somebody 
that it changes anything. And I'm, I'm starting to ask, I mean, okay, Chad, I got to cover one so, more thing. So all of that little thing there right there is why I absolutely hate this whole thing where we are, um, we are throwing party into city and school. It does not belong there. We are not voting for, you are not voting for somebody based on party. You're not. You need to be voting for the person who is going to, I mean, straight up. This is what I said to a member of this Board of Education within the last six months who is looking at me saying, I think I'm just going to resign. My response was, please don't. Okay? Please don't, because I need to feel like there's one person on that board that is going to fight for the best interest of my kid. And that has nothing to do with your party affiliation. Or whether you're going to get elected again in the future. It is strictly to do with what I have watched play out over the last couple of years and how you have voted and what you have brought forward and my belief that you are the one fighting for my kid. You're not alone, but honestly, there's just not enough of you. Because there are members of this, I, there are members of the former board that was there, that was there before the first year that I did not feel that did that. I just don't. There's a fine line. I mean, you know, you have to ask yourself the question and, and, and I don't, I don't understand. Um, I call it, uh, I, I, there's really not a word for it. Maybe I'll create a word and throw it in the urban dictionary again or something, but, uh, it, it, it just has to do with the fact that uh, people become like drunk on their political official. It's like, oh, I voted them in, and then next thing you know, you're changing a few of your morals to to be able to, because they do what they, you know, they want. You, I mean, it, there is so much stuff happening right now at a national level, Chad. And right. I didn't want to talk national level or anything, but we do have a primary that's coming up. Yes, we do. Um, and I, I mean, I, if you don't have anything else you want to cover before uh, we we exit, or I can go here. I don't or, have a ton to talk about when it comes to a primary, namely that, that I just, the one thing that I would like people to understand about the, the primaries, the parties are in control. Yeah. They set all the rules. That's who set the rules. Okay, it's not the county clerk's office. It's the party. You know, it's no accident that for years and years and years that we had one party in this county that you absolutely had to be registered and pre-registered as a member of that party to participate in that primary. And we had another party in this county they didn't care what your affiliation was. If you were registered to vote, show up and do it. They just didn't care. And that was for years. It is the parties that set those rules. If you don't like the rules that the party is setting, that's who you need to talk to. I mean, seriously. Don't go rant and rave at, at Rick over at the courthouse. Yeah. I mean, seriously, just don't. Yeah. Well, I mean, it happens anyway because people don't. And it's uh, going It's going to. Yeah. It's going to. Well, because ask some people because and that, we should be going back to, to only only a handwritten ballot and everything else and not even having... Uh, Again, the, it's the know. party that's going to set the rules for the, for the primary. It's the party that sets them. You don't want early voting and the party has said we're going to allow it, that it's going to happen. It is the party that sets the rules for the primaries. Yeah. Period. If ands... But's nothing. I mean, that's the way it is. And if you if you want to if you want to really see that in action, go back in time to the 2016 Republican Party primary. 
Okay? They decided that they were going to do everything on one day and everything was going to be done in Lindley Hall. And it didn't matter if you could get there or not. They were going to have their primary. That was it. The party set the rules. And they also set the rules as to who could actually vote. At that time, I was not registered in the Republican Party, so the only thing I could do is sit and watch. And the only reason I was allowed to sit and watch is that I represented the local media. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. But they you know, set it goes the back rules. To, it goes back to the thing where, um, you know, I am, I am, I accept the fact that we have labels that we wear and party affiliation and, and all of this, but these are supposed to be the mechanisms in which people can operate to get the in means accomplished. And it seems like, well, uh, it almost appears to me that there's a group of people and it seems like there's a lot of them when it comes to county by county by county by county and they're all of the same mind. If I can seize control of this, then I have power. And so I'm not talking about here you, locally in as you much are, as I'm talking about. You are about discussing in many ways people who have conflated two different words. There's authority and then there's power. Okay. So if you're a county commissioner, you have authority. That doesn't necessarily mean you have any power, but you do have authority. It's the same for anybody that's in any of these elected positions. You have been given by voters authority. Your power is very limited. And it's it is limited to your scope and your sphere. But you do have authority within your locale. Well, and you can also have more authority than you think you have. I got to catch this because I want to let people know in as much advance as possible about the upcoming primary. Right. What's the dates? Okay. On, uh, it's a, called a presidential preference primary. On, uh, you have to be registered by February 20th, and that's also the deadline to request a mail-in ballot. Uh, March 5th, early, vo early voting begins. March 18th, er early voting ends at noon. And March 19th is Election Day. So that was put out by the Harvey County, Kansas elections. Uh, I looked it up on social media. It came out. It's pretty easy to find. Uh, you should go there. It explains pretty much in detail uh, what's going on. Uh, it's it's horribly important for people to do this. A lot of the stuff that we covered on the program today, in my opinion, comes back to policy making and politics. It's so important, folks, that if you just realize if you are not going out and taking just the little bit of time that it takes to research these candidates, research what things are on the ballot. I mean, I'm talking a rhetorical thing. So it's not just in this situation. I'm a fan of voting. Please be informed. Please get out there and vote. It matters. It's important. And ultimately, those are the people that are making the decisions that and, have a big impact on your life. And primaries yeah. are important. Yeah. Very important. Primaries are very important. And, and, and primaries are why, I, very recently, I registered within a party. Because I wanted to be able to vote in the primary. Okay? I, I don't like poking people in the eye. I am going to poke the Harvey County Democrats again. Listen up, guys. Because you know what I'm about to say is true. I got really tired of there not being any, any choices for me on the ballots in the fall. Okay? I, I got sick of it. I... I bear no ill will towards Randy Haig. But how many times do I see him on the ballot uncontested? There's no Democrat. There's no Independent. There's no Libertarian. There's just Randy. He won the primary. Okay? I live in his district. I do not live in Becky's district. That is the exact same thing that happened in that election. She won the primary... 
We come out to the general. There's nobody else. I mean, we can we can run down the list over and over and over again. There's well. just not anybody there. So in order for me to have a voice in these elections, I had to register in a party so that I could vote in the primaries. Yeah, because that matters. And and I it guess it does matter. I guess goes back to what Especially you're saying. Especially living in Kansas. Yeah. yeah. It matters a great deal. It's like 85% Republican. Okay. Which, I mean, Kansas is so interesting in so many ways it's more when it like, comes to It's policy. more like 60%. But, but you know what I mean. I mean, just it's, saying. It's, it's interesting. It's interesting. You go out to like Western Kansas and once you get past, I don't know, Newton. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's true, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And I mean, it's 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 like uh, uh, it matters, people. It matters. It matters. It matters. It matters. Hold these that people primary, accountable. They are not rock stars. They signed up. They elected to serve you. And that primary is important. So please vote in it. Yeah. And you know, do a little, do a little homework and go vote in it now. The importance of this particular primary is probably not as great as some of those others that I've mentioned because this is a presidential primary. Yeah, yeah. Right? Um, but, you know, if you've got a strong opinion about who the next nominee should be, you need to vote in the primary. Yeah. Period. And, and we'll be talking about the results of the primary election in so many episodes to come. <laughs> right, Chad. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Just get ready for sure. it now because you know yeah. it's going to happen. You know, I watched some really wild stuff happen in 2016. <laughs> I'm telling you, just some really wild stuff. Since 20s, what are we in now? We're in 20. Oh, the last eight years. Wow. That's all I can say. Yeah. It, it, I, I watched. I mean, I, I. there are things that occurred during that with, with people I will not name. I'm just not going to do it. But just watching how they operated and then watching how they operated after the primaries, wow. It just is mind-blowing. It is absolutely mind-blowing. Mm. And, and so I'm glad that I sat and watched the whole thing, you know? Um, it was, it was the last time that I had a conversation of more than about four minutes with Marge Roberson. And I really, she, she tried to clue me in as to what I should expect to see. My mind still got blown and, uh, and I, and I miss Marge, but you know, that's a, that's a whole nother day. All right, Chad, we're coming to the end of the program. I got my last word in that I needed to make sure that I got out my plea to people. Uh, what do you got, my man? What do I got? Um, let's go with this. I am excited to unveil a new initiative at the Newton Kansan. And it's going to put the spotlight on what, and this is lingo that is coming from somewhere other than me. It's um, going to put the spotlight on different voices and ideas. And we're going to touch this off. We're going to start this off with a series of five interviews with five community leaders. And um, I have three of those persons confirmed and two scheduled. And I'm really looking forward to it because we're going to be asking a little bit different questions than we normally ask of these folks. And so I'm, I can't wait to get started. Uh, the, so a lot of this is going to get started next week. Very cool. Right. Um, through my own, not looking at the calendar correctly or properly or smartly, I scheduled the first two interviews on back to back days next week. Mm. Um, but that's okay, you know, because, you know, the, the, the whole idea is we're going to bring one of these out every week for about five weeks. Very cool. And getting a couple in the can and just getting it done, and that's not a bad thing. So that's Very what cool. we're going to do. Very cool. So, but, uh, you know, I've got, I've got right now, I've got some pretty heavy hitters, in my opinion, that are committed to, uh, 
to be a part of the part of the project. Very cool. Very so cool. that's my final thought, I okay. suppose. Well, and then look at that for the Kansan.com. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This is uh, the interviews will be done via video. You'll be able to see the entirety of them. Cool. Yeah, they'll be on the Kansan.com for sure. I'm still working out some of the technical stuff behind the scenes because, quite honestly, I just really don't feel like we're set up very well for a lot of that. So I'm just going to. I spend probably spend most of my weekend in my office trying to just put the final touches on everything to make sure that this can happen up cool. in, in a in a appropriate way, and uh, and then we'll be. I, I haven't decided if I'm going to relaunch a YouTube channel for the Kansan or not. Um, that's one of those things that if I do it, it's I'm just going to do it and beg for forgiveness later. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, you know that's that's part of the part of what we're considering right now. Well, you got to have that in the future of. Well, of, you, you uh, do, and you know we had one, and then we had an ownership change, and everything went away, and and so that's kind of why I'm just like, do I really do this? Because if we have another ownership change someday, and it all goes away, I'm not gonna be real happy. <laughs> you know, I love it. I love it. You know, it's like man. <laughs> Because I work pretty hard, and I don't like it when stuff just goes away. Ah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. But but that's that's coming down the pipe. All right. Well, cool, Chad. I'm looking forward to it, and looking forward to who you're going to interview and what you're going to talk to them about. So, cool. All right, folks. That was this week's episode of HC Talk with me, myself, and I, and Chad Fry. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. everybody. <laughs>